The title of my talk is Do They Deliver? Practical Load and Security Testing of Cloud Service Providers. And as it is, okay, this is a, a short introduction of my company, where I work, of ENW, which is located in Heidelberg. We are a, uh, a small uh, security consulting company. Uh, we are also organizing another conference. And our focus is on corporate security in very large and international environments. And in these environments, we also um, came to do some research on cloud security. And we're giving workshops and um, stuff like that. And in the course of this, um, activities, this, uh, this talk kind of developed. And as it is stated here, um, we have some war stories to tell. Um, the first part is um, a presentation of load testing results. So people kept asking us during the workshops, uh, what are the real benefits of cloud computing? And um, do they deliver what they promise um, when speaking of cloud service providers? And the second part is um, some results of um, penetration tests of cloud service providers or applications hosted at cloud service providers. Um, before this main part, um, of course, I want to give a short definition of cloud computing. Um, I will come back why uh, this is important and, of course, a short motivation why this topic is uh, worth to deal with. And even though it's um, a collection of war stories. Um, there are quite some lessons to learn when you want to use cloud-based services or deploy your IT infrastructure in a cloud computing environment. So um, we always try to abstract from concrete stories to more general, le general lessons that can be applied on a broader scale. So I want to start uh, with a definition of cloud computing. Um, this is usually a slide you see in any talk on cloud computing or cloud security because it's um, by now the only visualization of the most accepted definition of cloud computing. Uh, this definition is given by the NIST. I think most of you guys will be familiar with the NIST uh, and their guidelines. And I'm actually not that happy with the visualization which is provided by uh, cloudsecurity.org which is not stated on this slide, I don't know why. Um, but anyhow, this is a rather um, formal definition, a kind of academic approach, so I usually go another way. Um, who of you has um, already started any instances in any cloud service environment? Okay, four people? Okay, and I mean these are five? Okay, still not that impressive. Um, and I mean, basically, most of us are using any kind of what is called cloud-based services. Like, um, I, I assume almost anybody has a, a Google Mail account, um, whether you use it or not. Um, but still, I want to um, come to some more concrete examples what cloud computing means, actually means, um, besides this definition. And then I will come back to this definition. This is the uh, user interface of the Amazon EC2 web interface, the management interface, where you can uh, click on this button, and then eight clicks later, you have a fully functional uh, virtual server running. And um, those eight clicks take you maybe 30 seconds, and then another 20 seconds, and your instance is running. You have a public IP address. You have a full-blown um, Linux or Windows installation where you can log in. and. Um, by the same eight clicks, you can also start 20 instances of the same machine. So this is one example how cloud computing works. And I usually give this example because many people um, are not familiar with the term cloud computing. Anybody has heard it, but when we ask during our workshops, workshops we give on cloud computing, we have stuff like, oh yeah, um, cloud computing, that's this uh, stuff on image processing and editing in the internet um, because they are referring to um, a commercial of Microsoft, I guess, uh, where they offer such a service. Or even more interesting, there are also services like cloudgirlfriend.org. Um, you can register there, and for um, I don't know how many bucks per month, um, a girl keeps posting to your Facebook wall or writes you messages on Twitter and pretends to be a girlfriend. So this is obviously not really related to cloud computing, even though um, for some people this might be an interesting service. I don't know. Um, Actually, I heard on this on the radio, so don't get wrong ideas here. Um, <laughs> question, sorry? Do you have a link? I, I, and I don't know if it's cloudgirlfriend.org. Um, that's what I heard, so um, 
I'm not sure if it's correct, but I think Google will help you if you're in need. All right, these are examples why it is important to define cloud computing um, before we talk about security implications of it. So basically, this is a short, short spoiler for the definition. Um, what Amazon is offering here in his Elastic Compute Cloud, the EC2, um, is infrastructure as a service, such as infrastructure you get a um, virtual server that you can completely, completely operate by yourself. You can log in, you have root access or administrative access, and you can do whatever you want um, with this instance. Um, another cloud offering is the Google App Engine. In the Google App Engine, you have a so-called platform as a service environment, and you develop your applications um, using a well-defined API, which is provided by Google. In, ter uh, in terms of Google, it's uh, typically Java or Python applications with some um, um, special API calls that you can use um, to access the user authentication service or um, the data store. And when you have developed that application, you upload it, and your application is hosted in the same environment as Google Mail or Google Calendar is hosted. Um, you don't have to deal with the operation system level. Um, it's just important that you develop your application and Google takes care of all of the other stuff. So these are two typical uh, cloud service offerings and based on these offer... Okay, seems like there is a slide missing, so I go back. Um, Based on these two examples, um, I want to explain this definition a little bit more in detail. So um, the downmost layer shows some deployment models. Um, basically, the, the two on the left are important for us, which is public and private cloud environments. So public cloud computing um, is what Google or Amazon offers us, a platform where anybody can log in and use the resources um, as long as they pay, pay for it. Um, all customers are served on the same hardware. Um, every, every customer is treated equal to other customers and you get the same service as any other customer. And it's the most important thing, it's open for anybody and you have no idea um, whether you, uh, your services are run on the same hardware as the services of a market competitor or whatever, or your data is hosted next to the data of a market competitor. Um, the opposite is a private cloud computing environment. Private uh, means that the cloud computing is environment is operated exclusively for one customer. This does not necessarily, necessarily mean that it's operated by one customer. There are all, uh, also cloud service providers which offer the service to operate a private cloud for um, customers and then you use the hardware exclusively, you have your own storage and nobody else is using um, your computing resources. I will come back to this why private clouds are pretty interesting um, from a usability perspective. I mean, we have already seen the Amazon web interface and I think it's quite um, comfortable to have such a functionality like doing eight clicks and then having a full-blown Linux server running. Um, I said I don't like this visualization that much because it's um, supposing that there are real layers in a technical meaning, uh, which they aren't. So these layers are just a visualization of different characteristics of cloud computing. So um, the middle layer shows the service models which are offered by cloud service providers, uh, which are infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and software as a service. I think most of you have heard about this. So infrastructure as a service is providing um, virtual servers, virtual operating, operating systems that you can use. Platform as a service is providing an API. You develop your own application and then upload it to the cloud service provider who is then running this application in an environment by his choice. You cannot influence this environment. And software as a service uh, in turn is um, just using software which is hosted on um, uh, infrastructure and a platform as a service layer. This is an uh, important uh, fact usually. Um, actually, this layer is layered by itself. So um, any platform as a service cloud service provider uses uh, infrastructure as a service services to host his um, offering. And all software as a service um, or most software as a service offerings are based on platform as a service, which again is based on infrastructure as a service. So within this middle layer, we have uh, indeed uh, a layered architecture. Um, 
any of these offerings can be uh, offered in a private cloud or a public cloud, so there can be arbitrary combination of uh, between these different layers. Um, it's not like um, there's a strict uh, assignment of service models to deployment models. But the most interesting part uh, are the essential characteristics which are proposed by NIST for cloud computing environments. We have five characteristic characteristics which, ha which have to be fulfilled by any cloud computing provider uh, who wants to be called um, a cloud provider or anything with cloud in its name. So, um, on the left side we have broad network access. Um, I think this is pretty obvious. Your data is hosted on in a foreign data center. So both the data center and the client needs a broad network connection to be able um, to access this data in a usable way. Then we have rapid elasticity. This is one of the more important points. Rapid elasticity means you can scale up your resources uh, quickly up and down, like launching another 20 Amazon instances within seconds if you need it. And if you don't need it, you can scale it down. This is um, closely re related to the term pay as you go, which is also often cited when talking about cloud computing environments, uh, which is not um, included in these essential characteristics. Uh, the next one is measured service. Of course, the cloud service provider must be able to measure the resources you have used to be able to bill you. Uh, in turn, this provides quite good feedback um, about the research, resource usage your cloud services have. So um, this, this is kind of a win-win situation. The cloud service provider monitors for billing and the cloud customer gets quite good statistics about resource usage like um, processing um, power or bandwidth. Then we have on-demand self-service. Um, all of these other parts also apply to classic um, hosting providers, maybe. So the on-demand self-service is uh, quite important. You have management interfaces, like um, the one of Amazon. You can do eight clicks by yourself. You don't have to call any operator in the data center. Or you don't need human interaction. You even don't need to click. You can also run a script. And you can configure your cloud computing environment just the way you want it. And the most interesting part is resource pooling. Um, this is related to the economies of scale. Cloud service providers are able um, to provide you good offers on computing capacity because um, they pool their resources together uh, and thus, and thus uh, increase the um, utilization of their hardware and uh, thus have less spare capacity, um, which is a cost advantage. Um, or at least an often cited cost advantage. Related to this resource pooling is the concept of multi-tenancy. I was also already uh, talking about this when talking about public cloud service providers. Multi-tenancy means that on the same hardware, different customers are operated. So um, these different customers are um, isolated by different controls like virtualization or in the storage system on, on different access control mechanisms, access control systems on the network layer using kind of private VLANs or something like that. So this resource pooling is uh, closely related uh, to isolation and to the multi-tenancy concept. So um, given this definition, um, I also want to talk about a short motivation why it's important to deal with cloud computing. Of course, cloud computing is an emerging new technology and it introduces kind of a new central computing paradigm. Uh, if you use cloud computing, you have decreased cost and improved availability. At least this is what the uh, sales guys tell you when they uh, want to convince you to move your services to the cloud. And this works quite well. Um, I mean, during our cloud security workshops, um, we would like to say, okay, don't use the cloud for sensitive data, um, because that would be a good advice in many um, cases. Of course, it depends on the concrete situation. But usually, um, some managers already decided, they heard the sales guy spoken, and they know, okay, we can uh, reduce our uh, IT costs when we go to the cloud, so let's do this. Um, almost the same for any new technology. So, um, the main motivation to deal with cloud security or cloud computing is, um, do they deliver all of these promises? And that's why we performed some load tests. Um, partly be on behalf of customers because they were interested, what are the real benefits. And of course, we wanted to be able um, to give our customers valid feedback um, about uh, the scalability possibilities of cloud computing environments and um, 
how they perform usually. Now oh, this is the um, first part. As I said, do they deliver the scalability that they are promising? I mean, when we think about um, the essential characteristic, scalability is not part of it. So still, our customers usually uh, refer to kind of scalability or availability uh, when they talk about cloud computing and what they want to get out of it. So um, the first question is, um, do they deliver a scalable computing environment? In doing so, um, I evaluated three major cloud server, uh, service providers, which are Google App Engine, Amazon Elastic Beanstalk, and SalesforceForce.com. These are platform as a service providers, and from our point of view, um, platform as a service is a very interesting offering because it abstracts from a lot of uh, concepts for high availability. You don't have to deal with load balancing anymore. You don't have to deal with uh, data store redundancy and data, scores, uh, data store scalability anymore. And even more important, uh, there has not been an evaluation of platform as a service um, uh, performance yet. There have been some ev evaluation of infrastructure as a service performance, like uh, how well do the Amazon instances perform compared to the uh, Azure instances, even though Azure is a platform as a service environment. Um, but there has no um, evaluation be, be performed of platform as a service environments. So um, coming from the attacker point of perspective, um, I thought, okay, let's load test these platforms and let's see when they uh, break down. So the first step was to develop an application uh, which allowed the load testing. Um, this application um, must be able to run on these different platforms, so it was necessary to develop an abstract idea of a, of a small web application, uh, a small web shop application, which offered basic customer functionality like uh, buying products, searching for products, and stuff like that. So, um, of course, these applications had to be developed uh, following platform scalability best practices. Otherwise, um, the results would have not been meaningful because they say, okay, you're a bad coder, you did not follow our guidelines. So, um, these results do not really apply to our platform from, a point, from the cloud service provider point, maybe. And of course, I wanted to provide a comparison um, to the old world, so I also deployed this application on an old um, physical server. I will come back to the concrete server later. So, um, there were different challenges in doing so, uh, of course. Um, as a penetration tester and dirty script coder, it's not that um, easy to implement uh, applications on all of these platforms following uh, best practices. It was kind of a tough work when you're not used to developing. And it was important um, that they develop platform uh, put load on any component of the platform as a service stack. I mean, infrastructure as a service usually offers you a virtual system, but platform as a service environment um, utilize different components like load balancers, the underlying data store, the application server itself, and of course, the network infrastructure. So the application was developed in a way uh, which allowed um, the generation of load on any of these different components. Then, um, of course, it was necessary to develop a stable load testing framework. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of load testing frameworks available, um, but I think you know that when you're developing something on your own, um, the time to adapt a framework or develop your uh, own set of scripts which do the same um, almost um, holds equal. So, um, using this framework, I was uh, evaluating different cloud service provider. I already introduced them. Uh, in terms of latency, so which time does it take for the um, platform as a service environment to host, um, to serve the requests of increasing number of concurrent users. So the load testing framework simulated valid, valid users. Uh, one user, for example, does uh, five product searches, buys uh, three products, um, deletes his um, shopping cart for one time. Uh, I don't have the concrete numbers in my head, but something like that. This is one simulated user. And the load testing framework um, simulates one concurrent user, then two concurrent users, and so on, um, for a defined uh, maximum number of users. Of course, these users are simulated in parallel, parallel, so it was possible 
to measure the overall, overall time which um, the platform as a service environment uh, took to um, serve all of these requests. So coming to the first result. Um, the first result is of Google App Engine. Google App Engine provides you an environment um, to deploy your Java or Python application directly into a scalable hosting environment uh, comprising of a load balancer, application servers, and a big data store. Um, they give you feedback how many virtual servers are running at the moment to host your web application, but you have no way to influence the number of applications. This is the way how platform as a service environments usually work. You host your, your application there, and then take care of all the stuff to provide it in an uh, available and reliable way. So um, I simulated up to 50 users um, on the Google App Engine platform, and we see that the development of the latency um, up to 50 users um, increases a little bit more than linear. Still, this is not a bad footprint for our application. More interesting is that we can see that there are some areas uh, where the latency decreases again. And all of these areas can be directly um, compared to the time where Google started additional virtual instances. If I remember correctly, at the um, point when 50 concurrent users were accessing the application, I think Google used something like 16 instances. Um, to host the application still in an uh, acceptable time. So we also see that the time is increasing. This would have been um, more equal if uh, the same number of users would have been running for a longer time because the spawning of instances um, would have been finished and the instances would have been available to host the application. Uh, but still, the development is not that bad. So um, this is one result. It's not that interesting to talk about it when we have no comparison. So the next result is of the Amazon Elastic Beanstalk. I had a short introduction of the Amazon EC2, the Elastic Compute Cloud, um, which is the infrastructure as a service offering of Amazon. So the Elastic Beanstalk is a platform as a service middleware, uh, which uses all of the components which are offered by Amazon. So, uh, the Elastic Beanstalk uh, combines application servers and database servers um, hosted in the EC2 and um, a load balancing server service of Amazon which load balances uh, HTTP requests between the applications. So in case of Amazon, it is possible to define uh, thresholds like um, on a CPU utilisa utilization of 80%, please Amazon spawn more instances to host my application. And um, you can also configure the load balancing service. So I was mainly interested, um, how would Amazon be performing when we only have one instance running? So I used the biggest available instance at that time, um, which was a, uh, I think it was called um, four time extra large instance uh, with like some, something like 70 gigabyte of RAM and 16 CPU cores. I don't remember the correct numbers, but we have this development. This development curve is uh, basically better than the one of um, the Google App Engine. We see we have lower um, response times, um, overall response times for the increasing number of, of users. Almost no increase up to uh, like uh, 27 or 30 users. Then we have a little chitter and the latency incre increases to 60 milliseconds, uh, 60 seconds for all of the users. Um, this was, would be okay. We have experienced um, um, performance jitters in virtualized environments before. There are also papers on it which describe these jitters. But more interesting is um, the sharp, basically it's a drop um, when run, um, simulating more than 57 concurrent users. Um, it was reproducible that when I simulated more than 57 concurrent users, um, the Amazon instance became unavailable. So the load balancer answered with a HTTP 503 service unavailable error. And this was reproducible. Any time I simulated more than 57 users, uh, the instance became unavailable. Um, which is not a big deal. I mean, um, to um, serve 50 users, Google App Engine was using um, 16 instances. So this big instance um, was doing quite well, uh, up to 50 users. 
but still, um, simulating more than 57 users, um, it was possible to crash the application or the environment. Um, when I stopped the tests, it took um, five to six minutes, and then the, the environment recovered and became responsive again. So I will not make any overall conclu conclusions here. Um, let's see how force.com is doing. Um, yeah? What do you mean? Um, uh, kind of an anti-denial of service measure when they see that the load is too high? I mean, that would mean um, when a customer is hosting a high traffic application in the cloud, Amazon would turn off this instance because there's too much traffic. That's not the idea of a... Okay. Um, still, I do not get really the point. Um, you will, you will see later why I don't think this is true. I have another, another story on this. And basically, I don't think that a cloud service provider um, who you pay um, to host your application in an available way um, should turn off your instances if there's traffic on them. Well, did you read the terms and conditions? Yeah, I read that. They will state something about that, right? What? Like what? Are you referring to a concrete um, paragraph? Or? Um, true. I mean, they, they have something in the terms of condition like uh, we protect against denial of service, no, but only. You, 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 won't, you are not allowed to measure them. That's in the terms and conditions. Yeah, I mean, that, that would mean um, you, want, you want to host your application at Amazon and you're not allowed to perform load testing of your applications. And you may not publish uh, results of load tests. Yeah, I mean, basically, these are load tests of my application, yeah. so not of Amazon. Don't get me wrong here. Um, we'll, I mean, I will come back to this anti-denial of service stuff. We have another funny story later on. So, um, yeah, the results of force.com, I'm not really happy with them. I mean, basically, this is work in progress. And force.com offers a user interface, which is heavily relying on JavaScript. So it's not possible um, to use my pretty lightweight uh, curl-based um, load testing framework. So I had to use Selenium, maybe you know that, it's a um, web application test environment which utilizes browsers uh, for load testing. There are also commercial services like uh, BrowserMob, which does um, use Selenium for cloud-based load testing. So I, adopt, I, I adopted this approach and uh, due to my limited server-side, um, uh, client-side um, computing capacity, I was only able to simulate up to 14 users um, before the client-side limitations would uh, punch in. I mean, this is an important part. I always monitored the client-side um, system utilization to make sure um, that those drop is not because my client cannot handle uh, more concurrent users than 57 at a time. So we have the results of FOSS.com, which are uh, also interesting. FOSS.com has very poor response times. And we see that even um, from two to uh, something like six users, the um, response times almost double by a factor of um, two and a half. So these results are definitely not comparable to the other ones because this was uh, using the curl-based uh, load testing framework, and this is um, based on the Selenium results, which is a completely different thing. But also here we can see some decreases, maybe when additional instances are spawned. Um, and there were some other problems. But still, um, force.com is uh, pretty bad for load testing. So you should have that in mind when you think about uh, using force.com. Um, the more interesting result is that of the physical server. I was using a physical server with one gigabyte of RAM and like two CPU cores um, hosting, I think it was the same Tomcat, uh, I know it was the same Tomcat server version which was running at Amazon. And I load tested the exactly same um, um, application that was running on Amazon. And this is the result. I mean, this application, uh, this server was able to handle 70 concurrent users at the same time. Um, I mean, one can say my application is poorly developed, of course. But still, we have the direct comparison from the Amazon instance um, to this local um, server instance, which is way less powerful than the, than the Amazon instance. We have a, 
uh, was scalability um, development. It's not that bad, it's still uh, below linear, but um, if you remem remember the curve of uh, Amazon, it was way better. So this is um, an interesting result um, that you have to consider when you want to use cloud-based services. Amazon might not um, be as powerful for your processing um, as local instances may be. So um, this is where this point comes to play, horizontal versus vertical scalability. You can get from um, these results that I'm saying, okay, you should not use Amazon because they deliver poor performance. Um, this is partly true, as we saw. It depends on the usage scenario. Um, but in case of Amazon, you do eight clicks, and then you have not one instance, but uh, five instances, and an automatic uh, load balancing service. So this is way easier to scale when you go beyond the limitations that you have on, uh, for your physical servers. And when you have your physical servers, you cannot just, okay, you can turn them off, but you don't get the money, the initial investment back. So um, this is a pretty important point I want to make. Um, cloud computing environments rely heavily on what I call horizontal scalability, like many instances which host the application, and not vertical um, scalability, make the system bigger and bigger. I mean, there's a limit. We all know that, uh, also for Amazon, even though you can get uh, pretty big instances there. So, and each cloud service provider has different characteristics, and you have to address them uh, when you develop your application. Um, you have also to have these um, characteristics in mind when you want to plan for your load testing in the cloud computing environments. But I will come back uh, to this later in my overall summary. Um, speaking of Amazon and the ability to have eight clicks and scale your environment from one instance which hosts 50 users to 20 instances which serve uh, 20 users, um, still sounds pretty nice. But I guess you have all heard um, about security concerns in cloud computing environments. So, um, the scalability advantage um, by management interfaces which allow quick scalability in a horizontal way uh, is one advantage of cloud computing. Um, for me, the term security concerns is way too general. So, I was thinking, <clears throat> how could we refine security concerns in cloud computing environments? Um, we cannot have a structured discussion about this when we are not even clear about the concerns that we have. So, um, when I think of an evaluation we did, um, these concerns become a little bit more clearer. Uh, we had an evaluation of a software as a service, cloud service provider. Um, they offered some kind of a human resources management solution. And a customer of us um, wanted to know from us, okay, we have these three cloud service providers which is the most secure one. So um, we had to do an evaluation of the cloud service providers and one of the three cloud service providers agreed um, that we were allowed to perform a pen test. I mean, this is also related to the terms of use. Um, you're not allowed to do penetration testing um, of your cloud service instances at Amazon. Um, you have to f um, request the you have to uh, fill in a request for that service. So um, you write, um, you use a, a web form you know, hosted at Amazon, and you submit your request, and then Amazon says, okay, um, you have three days, and you're allowed to pen test your own applications in the cloud. Mm. So this is um, pretty true for all cloud service providers. You don't have much room for contract negotiation. So it was quite surprising that um, at least one cloud service provider agreed that we uh, performed the pen test. So, um, the target was a human resources web application. Um, I don't want to tell much about the details, it's not important. So, our penetration test had to be, of course, a typical web application pen test, including pen testing of the server infra infrastructure and pen, 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 pen testing the cloud um, infrastructure like automatic scaling mechanisms, the management interfaces, um, the network separation, the separation from other customers. Um, this would have been the second uh, step of the test. So, unfortunately, there was no need to perform cloud-based load testing. Uh, after one day, we stopped the test because we had more severe findings than uh, in most other pen tests, um, which lasted 20 days or more. So, uh, there wasn't a need to perform any cloud-based testing. So, um, one of the 
main findings was the HTTP put to the web root was possible. So we were able to upload our, uh, I think it were Java files, they were executed, and we were able to compromise uh, the complete application server. Um, I'm not sure when you've seen HTTP put enabled on a web server the last time, but for us this is something like um, years ago. Um, such a finding um, we saw last in the 90s or something like that, but usually people learn that uh, HTTP put uh, is a bad thing, and um, actually I don't know how, what is possible to enable HTTP put on an Apache web server. I mean, all of the application servers have this disabled by default. I can only imagine that there were some uh, REST style services running which usually, usually uh, utilize uh, alternate HTTP methods. But still, um, this is a horrible security footprint. Um, another reason for this being enabled might be that as a short time to market, any, uh, anybody wants to do cloud, and cloud is kind of abstracted from the technical concepts. I mean, you do eight clicks and you have a um, virtual instance in the internet running with a public IP address. Or you, up, you upload your application and it is hosted in a um, load balance environment, so no need to deal with the technical concepts of this. Um, still, this is a pretty bad, bad idea um, to have HTTP put enabled and it was a horrible finding for us. So, um, I was talking about structuring these security concerns. For us, this meant um, we have to find another way to ensure security. I mean, um, the cloud service provider was willing to address these issues. Um, this is maybe an interesting side note. Um, I think two months later or something like that, we had a retest. and. Um, Guess what they did um, to close the findings that we had? Any guesses? Okay, I mean that, that would have helped, um, at least for our pen test. I guess what, that would also be an interesting choice. Yeah, good idea. No, uh, of course they put a web application firewall in front of it. So um, all we had to do was to, was to encode the put in another way and we still had the same finding, but this is only a short side note. Um, of course, these findings um, can be abstracted to more general conclusions. Um, we have typical um, controls that we uh, recommend customers when they have to deal with outsourcing providers, uh, third-party vendors, or whatever. And risk analysis and trust evaluation is usually a part of this. So, um, I want to introduce the system operation lifecycle. This system operation lifecycle life um, elaborates the steps which, which are necessary to operate a system. Um, for example, um, you have hardware which is operated by your employees, you have your operating system installed um, by your own employees, you can harden that operating system, and um, based on the different colors, um, these are the areas of responsibility which you can influence. Uh, the black ones, um, are basically steps in the operation lifecycle you cannot influence. The cloud service provider is responsible for the steps and you have to trust the cloud service provider that he uh, will perform these in a secure way. There is no other way um, than you control these steps. You cannot control the employees of the cloud service provider. Um, you have no custom contracts which can address th these issues and in terms of a platform as a service provider, um, you cannot harden your operating system which is, uh, which is um, in this, uh, used in this platform as a service stack. So, um, I think I have to hurry up a little bit. Um, what the system operation lifecycle is telling us, it's not possible to secure the cloud by all aspects. There's simply no possibility because these areas, at least these areas, um, the yellow ones also are under, under control of the cloud service provider in platform as a service environments. It's just not possible to secure the cloud. So um, when we look at several risks which are provided by NISAM in a comprehensive risk analysis document, um, these are the main risks um, in cloud computing environments. And these risks can be directly mapped to steps in the system operation lifecycle. So um, for example, loss of governance. I mean. The governance of your data, you can influence them in steps 1 to 30, at least 1 to 9. Um, you cannot influence in a cloud service environment. Same for isolation failure. When you think about um, patch virtualization, uh, appropriate network se separation mechanisms, all that stuff, um, 
the network is definitely not under your control. Uh, neither is the storage which is used by the cloud service provider to host your data. Um, and of course, malicious insider is the classical example, even though I would not um, consider this to be a high risk in cloud service environment. Um, there are other ones which are more relevant from my point of view. But still, um, you cannot mitigate these risks because you cannot tell the cloud service provider, okay, you do not hire this guy, you only hire this guy. That's not possible. So this is what um, the system operation lifecycle wants to provide. Um, a short help to structure security concerns. Is this a security concern which we can address or do we have to trust um, the cloud service provider. And trust is another important concept um, which we usually use uh, at ENW. Um, when we cannot control something, um, you have to trust some, something to be confident at the end. And this trust is usually uh, based on some trust, trust factors uh, which you can assess um, for a cloud service provider as well. Um, these trust factors mean different things. Um, we have the trust factors symmetry and transparency. Symmetry basically means um, does, the does the cloud service provider trust us? And transparency, are his processes transparent? Uh, does he provide any documentation about, about his security operations and stuff like that? So basically transparency and symmetry would be um, the trust to perform a pen test. If they do not trust us enough um, to allow us to perform a pen test, um, this directly affects our trust that we are putting into the cloud service provider. Um, another uh, relevant trust factor is consistency. So what happened in the past? How did the cloud service provider perform in the past? Were there security incidents? Were there outage, outages like the Amazon outages in, I guess, April and June? Um, and also, um, the past pen test results. So, uh, the cloud service provider we evaluated um, were transpar was transparent and also trusted us, but uh, the results from this consistency, uh, from, from this uh, transparency and symmetry, directly affected uh, the consistency of the cloud service provider. And a last part is the value of reward. What do we get out of trusting the cloud service provider? And this can be partly evaluated um, following the introduced load testing approach that I uh, proposed. So these are basically um, trust factors. Um, and I tended to put high trust in Amazon at the beginning of 2011 um, because they, um, they, had a, they had no relevant security incidents by that time. They had no outages. They were very transparent. They had the best security documentation of all cloud service providers. And um, the prices were really good. So we also had a value of reward. So I tended to trust uh, Amazon at least uh, until the beginning of 2011. So um, we also had some projects um, which did not process confidential data. And we used Amazon a lot. And most of our customers were interested in the usage of Amazon. So uh, we have an Amazon account. And in, in the course of our regular internal password audits, we also audited the quality of our Amazon account password, um, which is bullshit. We just wanted to see what is Amazon doing when we try to brute force our own account. But still, this was kind of the official statement. We had a regular password audit. So what we are doing was uh, brute forcing the default Amazon um, login interface. Um, uh, fun fact, by the way, this is the same login interface that you use um, to purchase DVDs or CDs or whatever you order on Amazon. So the same user account you use for DVDs, you can also use to order virtual servers um, or virtual platform services. So um, even though it was a tricky setup, the minimal password requirements of Amazon were um, six characters, no other restrictions. So we set our password to a six, uh, six um, uh, number password, six numbers, um, no other characters. And we tried to brute force that stuff. It was not that easy to brute force. Um, I was quite surprised I didn't do brute forcing um, for a long time before that. Um, and most current brute forcing tools do not cope well with modern uh, web application authentication mechanisms like a lot of cookies with different scopes and redirects and stuff like that. So uh, I used the burp suit 
Um, I think quite some speakers mentioned it. Uh, for the brute forcing progress, and even though it's not a tool for brute forcing, um, it did quite well. Um, we performed on our peak times uh, 80,000 requests per hour, and we had, including some try runs um, over two days, something like four, four million requests from one IP address. This setup was uh, set up in uh, about 20 minutes. It's described in a more detailed block entry. And basically, for some hours, we performed 80,000 requests per hour for our account, for our um, password. We iterated through uh, 0001 to 99999. So basically, it was possible to brute force our password, uh, which is, of course, not our actual one. We do not use um, only six numbers, even though it's not a productive account. Um, I mean, it's also not uh, hard to anticipate what the brute forced password was, but um, anyhow. So it was possible to brute force our password. I think that's not that surprising that it's possible to brute force passwords in 2011. Uh, the more interesting results was um, that there was no account logout, no connection throttling, no capture solutions, and um, no reaction from Amazon. So no email for us, hey, it seems like your account is being abused or something like that. No reaction at all. So uh, following a responsible uh, disclosure approach, uh, we contacted Amazon and told them, hey, um, we performed a regular password audit and there was no response from your side. And this was uh, what I was getting. So. Uh, Hello, Matthias. Uh, thanks for contacting us. Um, it's great to hear from customers who are passionate about security just like we are. Um, and then, we have noticed that your account has a difficulty in authenticating properly, and we are actually about to contact you. So, um, this is a funny side note. I mean, there's a, there's a long part of the email which I skipped because um, it's more funny when it's put that way. Uh, and also, I wrote that email on Saturday. Um, this was the response on Monday, so they were actually about to contact us. Um, still, to be fair, besides laughing, um, we had a very good response of Amazon. Um, we had an interesting uh, conversation. They implemented a capture solution within two weeks or something like that, and we re-evaluated it, and at least our brute force attack was not possible anymore. So, basically, the Amazon security team did a very good job, at least um, we thought. Um, but this was the, the first thing which affected my trust in Amazon. The next one, um, some days after, I think it was in uh, mid-October uh, 2011, some researchers from the Ruhr Universität Bochum, Germany, presented a paper which is called All Your cloud, uh, Clouds Are Belong to Us. And basically, they were able to bypass any Amazon authentication mechanisms. So this is uh, way more interesting research than doing a simple uh, Amazon brute force login. Um, still, this was kind of a gray zone, for a, a legal gray zone for okay, a company like us. And this, trust, uh, this results um, completely destroyed my trust in Amazon. I mean, the complexity of the web interfaces is enormous. And basically, the web interfaces nowadays are the keys, keys to our data center. If you host a lot of applications um, at Amazon, um, the web interfaces are key to our data center. So um, the overall security posture of web applications is not that good from our point of view. And I'm out of time, so I have to skip this a little bit. Um, but at least I was uh, tempted to believe that someone looked at the Amazon web interface. And if we performed ten pen tests, we would have recommended them, um, please implement brute force mechanisms, and please do not implement crypto by yourself, which makes such stuff possible. So. Um, this trust was destroyed, and one minute of conclusions. Um, do load testing of your cloud service environments to be sure that they perform as you expected, and adopt the necessary changes in your infrastructures, like using the horizontal scalability and not relying on bigger and bigger systems. I mean, this is the way how cloud computing works. And, um, of course, protect your management interfaces and evaluate a cloud service provider. Thank you.